Um, so um, here we are, um, and uh, this evening, what we're going to do. Oh, before we get started, I wanted to point out this is Green Tara, uh, whose mantra uh, Bob taught us uh, this e this afternoon, and we take him and we can thank Craig for this. He printed it out for us, and it's a beautiful, beautiful version. Thank you so much yeah. again. So maybe um, at the break, uh, come take a look. Um, you can see um, see her. She's um, Bob. Do you want me to talk about the sure, image sure, again, or, and, and correct me if I have it wrong? Sure, sure. She's um, she's seated in a particular posture where she's got one leg coming out. So whenever you see a Tara who's got a leg extended, you know she's a green Tara because. Um, she, this, is, this means compassion and action. Right? So she's entering into the world to help. And you know, Bob was talking about how she's a savioress, and so she's ready to enter into the world to to help um, living beings. <coughs> That's the uh, and whenever you have in the tankas, whenever you have the sun and the moon, you often see one in each corner. Uh, as I understand it, in Bob. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is, it means the mastery over duality, right? That the, that the deity has the mastery over duality. What, what do you mean? When you have a, a sun and a moon on either side of the tanka, uh, does that indicate a mastery over duality? Sort of, yeah. Sun and moon are for right and left channels of yoga. Uh -huh. And they're, they're, it has multiple meanings. Uh, yeah, it does. Okay. It does. So, there's That's a good thing, mastery of duality. So, uh, so what we're going to do this evening is we're going to uh, take questions and um, you know anything from the channeling, anything that we did from this morning. I know some of you had some pretty strong experiences during the break and lunch. And then of course we had Bob's uh, wonderful lecture on Tara and um, the, the, the way to kind of confront this calamity that Boxes have um, for us as an example. So, um, so anyone who has any questions on anything that we've covered today, uh, we're going to go ahead and you can say, you know, we can, we can say who you'd like to an answer the question or if you want to ask <coughs> Please speak in a bigger voice. I can have a hearing aid. They're not that good. <laughs> Just. Um, during the meditations, you guys um, talk about um, visualizing ourselves as the deity. Could you both speak to that and what that practice is? I think it's called deity yoga and how visualizing yourself as Tara and what that practice is. Um, this was you, you, you used that. We haven't talked about that yet, but, but it is something that happens. So he's asked, did you hear it? Good question. Yeah. about that. Uh, when you visualize yourself as a deity? Yeah, he, he's asking about that practice. So that's in the, the area of Tantra. Um, and, uh, and so to do that, one has to receive initiation. And uh, it's, it's kind of complicated. But basically it has to do with, uh, you, have to, you have to, in order to receive that initiation in Tantra, one has to have achieved some kind of a level of understanding, not a total, necessarily visceral, full scale understanding, but a level of understanding of emptiness. And uh, so, in order to explain that, I have to explain a little bit about emptiness, but this is QA, I don't really know what I'm saying, but I can maybe briefly say that uh, emptiness, you've all heard of emptiness, presumably, in relation to Buddhism. Shunyata, wonderful word. And, uh, and people wrongly thought, in both in Asia and in the West, and there are some people in the West who still think that emptiness is sort of equivalent to nothingness. And then some sort of dark space with nothing in it is emptiness. And I guess that's a kind of emptiness. But the, the Shunyata, emptiness, that is meant in, uh, in Buddha's teaching, which is very key teaching of the Buddha. Uh, is equivalent to selflessness. And again, people misunderstood selflessness as to mean that 
you don't exist. And the enlightenment is Buddha suddenly discovered, hey, I'm not here. <laughs> and then he went out and said to people, we're all not here, so listen to me. Which people would have had to be insane to listen to that. So actually selflessness just only means that your sense of yourself as having a fixed identity that is unrelated to the things around you, that you have a point of subjectivity, that you have a soul, if you want to call it that, that is somehow absolute and un in the sense of unchanging and completely unaffected by anything around it, and it's the real you. That sense, which we all subliminally do have, actually, unless we are somewhat enlightened, uh, is what we're empty of. I mean, the object of that sense, like if I think I have a real Bob in here, and that's a, it's an unchanging thing. And in, all, in ancient time, they used to have little images of people with little homunculi in their heart or something, you know, you'd see pictures like that. But then they put a little Krishna in there, or a little Jesus in there, or a little Buddha in there. And then that was when they wanted to make it nice, you know? otherwise it was a little person like himself. And Woody Allen has himself and Burt Reynolds in the Meaning of Life movie. They were in the brain, and looking out of the eyes, and they were pulling levers and the body was a robot with a little mini self in there, which was the same old Woody Allen. You know? Although Woody Allen, if you remember, he was going to be a sperm, so he bailed out to go out and discover what life was about. He's had Burt Reynolds controlling the room. <laughs> <laughs> so those are all kind of, that's a jokey thing about, about the subliminal feeling people have. And if you think about yourself, when you, if you introspect for a moment about yourself, maybe we'll do that meditation tomorrow, you, you sort of come to a place in the sort of back of your brain we very focused on our brains of the Westerners. In Asia, it's more the heart, you know, Taoism and Buddhism. Right? We get into the brain, and we sort of think there's a point of awareness back there somewhere. That's the real me looking at everything, and I'm always the same me. I'm always the same. And you, and you can test yourself. I look at a photograph of yourself 20 years ago or 10, if you're younger. And, and then you remember the scene that that photograph of you was about. And then you will sort of get back, oh yeah, well, I remember I was there, and then it's the same you that was there. You feel like, this. but now, but logically you know, you're completely different than that you that was there. So this sort of rigid, fixated self-identity habit, as the brilliant, deep Buddhist psychologists called it, or self-reality habit, or self-objectivity habit, is broken through by pursuing the quest of emptiness. Because what emptiness means is that everything, not only persons, but also objects, like that table, when, you know, like Plato thought that table had an essence of tableness, which is what made it a real table. And so and that was just reflecting the subliminal feeling, like the floor. We feel that there's something objective about the floor that's intrinsic to the floor, it's unrelated to its relational constitution and location, and even the atomic constitution of it, if you follow me. We don't feel it's just a relational thing, it's like it's a real floor. Modern sociologists of knowledge, which is an actual field, have a great expression for this. Things seem to present themselves to us as having a massive facticity. Ah! <laughs> I love that. It's like it looms up at you, oh, that's the real floor. And then you loom up out into the world yourself. That's the real me, I'm the real me. Right? So this intrinsic identity feeling that we have, and look at the Latin word identity. Idem means the same. So identity means sameness. So it's right there in the language. Anyway, that we're empty of that. So there's no such thing. We are 100% relational beings. Body and mind. And the and soul. We ha and actually we have a soul. But it's a, if you define a soul, the super subtle body mind that goes from life to life. The Buddhists agree that we have a soul. So selflessness doesn't mean soullessness, actually. It just means there's no fixed thing in all of that. It makes it what it is. It's relationships 
and its processes make it what it is, and it keeps changing what it is. So therefore, the realization of emptiness, at whatever depth that one realizes it, liberates, in a way, it liberates one in one way from being stuck in being a particular thing that never can change. But it also puts a burden of responsibility on oneself because if you realize that you are a relational work in progress, constantly changing, very influenced by your environment, very influenced by your parenting, and not only that, your culture, and not only that, in the Buddhist case, the previous lives, and so on, then you have to take responsibility in shaping your being. Because if you don't, the TV programs and the commercials will shape it, the radio show running, rattling in your ear will shape it, and your language will shape it, etc. In other words, there's no fixed thing that's you. You are completely swimming in a universe of relativity. And, but within that, you have the choice to choose. You, you have become human, and so you have intellect. So you can choose how you relate to things. And therefore, you can associate with good relativities, friendly, nice, beautiful, helpful, ethical. And then you become more helpful, beautiful, ethical, and so on. Right? Now, the reason, I'm sorry I had to go around on that to answer his question. I don't know why he was that question. But, you know, therefore, if you understand that at some level, and in a way, the modern person is well equipped to understand it, because we sort of have even, if we're not scientists, we have popular notions of quantum physics, of the illusiveness of the theory of relativity, and the notions of anatomy, everything changes in cells and the body, the cosmic rays and the x-rays, all going to everywhere. So we have a notion of the basic instability of matter, even, even though people shout about matter on the materials. But we know it's all very unstable. But then the danger is we'll connect it with material science and we'll stop, we'll stop and think that well, we don't exist, that we don't have a mind, we don't have a soul, we're just a robot, material processes. And, we're, and then we think the fixed thing in there is nothingness. And when we go to sleep at death, that we'll be back in the fixed thing which is the unchanging nothingness. That's the danger of materialism. So the Buddhist thing, but my point is that when the Buddhists realize emptiness, what you realize is that you are your own work of art. And of course your work of art hangs on a wall, it has the wind blowing on it, or people spilling coffee on it, or whatever it is, it's a relational thing. But you're the artist of your own life. And you shape yourself like like Dalai Lama is supposed to be a holy man, he's very wise, he's mass massively educated. He once was asked by a TV interviewer who had managed to talk his way into filming him all day long, so he was there at 3 30 in the morning, he was meditating. And that guy asked him, Your Holiness, what are you doing now? And the Dalai Lama looked at him and he said, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, Well, I know that, but I mean, what, are, what do you do now when you do this in the morning? The Dalai Lama said, I'm shaping my motivation. I'm going to have a busy day, and I have this and this and this and this to do. I want to make sure my choices, my actions, are shaped and motivated by compassion, not by some sort of ego trip or some any other thing. And he, so, he, so he's you know, trying to be the artist of his life. He has the resilience of personality. He definitely has an ego, all of us do, but he's trying to shape that ego be better. Enlightenment in Buddhism doesn't mean you don't have an ego. It means you've shaped it to the optimal massive of the infinite state. But never mind that, I don't want to talk about that. So when you realize that, then how Tantra is, the technology, Tantra somehow means like continuum and also sort of technology. And it's the technology of shaping the self in the ultimate positive dimension. But it, can, it is unsafe to get into that if you still have that rigid sense of self. Although you might still have some of it subliminally, but you mentally know, when I feel I'm the absolute me, I'm making a mistake. You know that by inference, by reason, understand. In other words, you know that because I feel I experience something, because I see something, because I have an emotion, I'm relative. An absolute I couldn't have an emotion, couldn't change, couldn't feel, couldn't even see. Because that would change it to see something, and it wouldn't be absolute, it would be nothing. You follow? So my relative self is empty of my absolute self. And therefore, anytime I'm feeling I'm absolute, I'm 
making a mistake. If you know that at a deep level, sort of with evidence, reasoning strongly, then you can turn to practice of time. You don't have to necessarily have a visual experience of your absolute sort of self disappearing under analysis, which is what the way how you deepen it. But you don't have to have the deepest level. So if you have that initial level where the point being that in Tantra someone will, might tell you, okay, now you're initiated in the practice of Tara. And you know, then you talk to Banja, then you talk visualization, and then the, and then you also talk visualization of yourself as Tara. But that means because you already know that whatever you feel like yourself is a constructed state and a relational changeable state. So then you can choose to shift in a meditative state into feeling divine, to feeling very exquisite, to feeling very confident, like a deity feeling, if you follow me. And you won't get stuck in it. Where you then, I know, now I'm Tara, so like, I'm not going to wash the dishes. So <laughs> we had one guy, a yogi guy, once visiting us in some summer school we did years and years ago before we were at Menla, we were at Amherst. And he was like, I'm a yogi, I don't wash dishes. And he was not popular. <laughs> <laughs> he was visualizing himself as Vajradhara or something, you know, some dead Buddhist deity. And he thought he shouldn't wash dishes, therefore. Meanwhile, he doesn't know Buddhist deities do wash dishes. <laughs> They're very good dishwashers. So, so the answer to your question is that it's a marvelous aesthetic thing. Tantra uses aesthetics and it uses psychology because there are some insights that you can't have on the basis of I never understand and I'm so humble and I must be ignorant and so forth. So you then experiment with a state where I'm totally aware of everything and I feel totally great and I'm made of bliss and you visualize that. And by visualizing yourself like that, even though you know at the same time you don't really you don't really feel like that, but you sort of develop a stability of it's like you you you're going on you go on da 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 swa da 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 swa and then your mind wanders off into something else and you bring it back to da 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 swa. So when you do that kind of thing, antara antara, and then the mind wanders off. No, I'm not. I'm Bob, and I'm not even not even thinking about antara antara, and I'm feeling pissed off, I have a headache, and blah blah blah. And, and then you bring it back to that. Then you deepen your feeling of what you can aim for to actually become. So they say you develop, you cultivate externally. You visualize your body as Tara's body, and and mentally you visualize your mind as having Tara's Buddha insight and Buddha confidence and Buddha pride. Actually, they talk about pride, Buddha pride, and this gives you a certain kind of experimental state like being in a mandal and something where you feel secure in a certain way and you can open your sensitivities and your imagination etc but but it's unsafe to do that because you know because if you have this still you have never seen through if you've never examined and therefore seen through to some extent one's visceral sense of being a fixed being because the danger is that you'll transfer your sense of fixity onto some Fabulous, magical thing, because some Lama told me in a ritual that I was Tara. And then you go around acting like you're Tara, and because it, it reinforces your habitual, ordinary ego, if you follow me. Ordinary, ordinary egotism. You get, you get it? So you move back and forth, in a way. and you, you have the flexibility, the resilience of identity, to shift back and forth between the, your Tara identity and your ordinary identity. You follow and of course, in Tantra, this is very profound. And uh, males will visualize themselves as female in long-term meditation. <laughs> Females will visualize themselves as males in long-term meditation. Sometimes a single person will visualize themselves as a couple in erotic embrace. Sometimes they'll visualize themselves as a multi-armed, multi-headed, multi-legged, ferocious deity, etc. In other words, and all of those visualizations, when sustained with, with systemic concentration and strongly strongly cultivated concentration, actually affect the structuring of the inner nervous system in a very sophisticated scientific way. It's very highly technical, tech, very high tech. And it's a beautiful, it's a magnificent tradition, actually. It really is. But that's what that is. Thank so you. we're not quite doing that. <laughs> in other words, we work more at the prerequisite of that, which is, you know, actually, you know, we all have a little bit of anxiety 
we have two things. One, we have a rigid fixed thing that we think we're a fixed thing, a gamma bhakta. It doesn't actually come out in our normal behavior that much. We don't notice it even. But if we really lose our temper, if we really become obsessed, if we really become depressed or manic, then we start behaving as if the whole thing is absolute. You know, like the angry person will smash their head into the wall, which is not really good for their head, but it's not particularly good for the wall either, usually. But the head is very bad for the head. But they, that's like, because my rage makes me an, it's an absolute tool. It means that my fury has taken hold of me by the handle of my subliminal, subconscious sense of fixed self. So then the emotion dominates me. You follow me? It becomes, I can't resist it, I can't question it in my, it becomes an automatic reaction. Similarly, it's some sort of obsession. I have to have that thing. And I know it's harmful to everybody, it's caused a mess. You know, but some guy who robs a bank or, you know, Bernie Madoff or something, can't stop. So that's also because that emotion takes him, he becomes a tool of the emotion. He loses his reasoning. And then people, when they get stupefied, the third major poison, you know, the three poisons are greed, hatred, and delusion. And when they become internally stupefied about their fixed self, and they get into how, I'm a mess, the world hates me, I hate the world, it's helpless. You know, and then combine that with materials of all I have to do is shoot myself and I'll just be permanently unconscious. Which, of course, they, fortunately, they soon discover when they wreck their brain and their body that they're still around and feeling evil and depressed. They don't have a body they can like, pump up with Prozac. <laughs> so, so uh, those give us the clue that there's some miswiring inside that although we rationally know there's nothing fixed in our cells, and every cell changes, and, you know, our cells completely replace themselves in a year or two or something, I forget the biological timing of it, and every atom and molecule is totally zooming around all the time. <laughs> and, they, and finally nobody knows what they are. <laughs> we have particle paradox. We know that rationally, but still viscerally we think we have the solid fixed thing. That's right. <clears throat> so that we'll work on, that's really valuable. Now, possibly, so, it's coming back to the context of the, of the woman. The woman is more aware of that naturally than the male. The male tends to get more fixated on the fixated itself. But of course, it only tends to, because females are also very, very, very fixated on their identity too. There's no ultimate difference between the two, They're only relevant. As we now know, actually in ancient time, if you wanted to be a Buddhist monk, but I was a Buddhist monk, I had to answer an ancient question. And it asked me if I was a dragon posing as a human. And I said, no. Okay, good, you pass. You're not a dragon. That's <laughs> one of them. Apparently, dragons were trying to get into the Buddhist community. Like, posing as a human, becoming a monk. Well, there were two of them right and, here, Nana and me. <laughs> and then they asked you, have you had a sex change operation for the third time? <laughs> and I never really tracked that down. But it seems that once or twice, it's not disqualified. <laughs> You're cooked. You're not, we won't ordain you. That's a problem. Sorry, Okay, I know that's a long answer. I apologize. But that's your fault, Jeff. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, I, uh, And how it 
relates to ego for women. Um, because I think even in the context of understanding one's own ego as a woman, so much is culturally defined by patriarchy that um, even in my own journey through this, like finding what that I don't, I'm struggling with how to put this in words. Um, I guess just what your thoughts are on the, on the journey of the ego and, you know, and feminine identity in the contemporary world. Yeah. You can take it, you can take it. Take it. Yeah. Take it. I love to hear both of your thoughts if you think possible. Well, who did you direct it to? I, I would love to hear both of your yeah, thoughts. Right. Yeah, right. You start. Well, I think that one of the things that, I, th I think one of the places that you were trying to navigate was this issue of power and power dynamics, and how do you step into your power without becoming ego-laden, and how do you, how do you hold the, the power of the divine feminine without becoming identified as being a holder of the divine feminine, and therefore having, you know, having that be kind of a power mask that you're using. Right. And um, I think that, um, there, again, we need to look at the two types of power. There's personal power, and uh, which is based, which, which is, um, which, has the, which has more of a tendency to become uh, in that laden, crystallized place that Bob is talking about, where people are, are using the power of their own will, using the power of their own um, identity to try to take power or have power over someone else's identity or personal power, right? And that, those kinds of power exchanges are um, characteristic of the, the, the exchanges between males and females in a cultural context. And most cultures have uh, structures and ceremonies that proscribe and um, intensify and solidify the power exchanges. You know, for instance, you have even today in marriage ceremonies, you have the father giving the daughter to the husband, right? So there's definitely, like in this ceremony, in this cultural structure, there's the very clear message that the power of the female, which is essentially the reproductive, generative power of the great feminine, is owned by the father, and the father is now transferring it to the husband, right? So uh, those are the kinds of power exchanges that, that males and females get caught in in the, in the cultural exchange. And one of the things that I often tell my students um, is that it is your responsibility to actually go beyond your cultural conditioning. That if you want to become enlightened as a being, that you have to find out who you are outside of your cultural conditioning. And one of the great things about doing something like a, a deity meditation is that you are stepping outside. As Bob said, you're stepping outside of your identity. You're identifying with this larger thing. And the good news is when you're doing a daily meditation where you are, you are merging your personal energy with the universal power of the, of the deity, you have a better understanding of what universal power actually is. And this is one of the, one of the great teachings that you do receive from daily meditation, which is to actually feel in a visceral way what it means to be holding universal power. And you can you know, compare that with your everyday identity where you're running personal power and when you get caught in power exchanges on, of personal power. And the more you learn the difference between those two things, the more you learn how to separate your identity from your cultural conditioning, the more you move outside of the power exchanges or being attached to the power exchanges. And one of the things that women course, got stuck in in the 70s, and which they still get stuck in today um, uh, in certain places where they're working with um, um, 
males, for instance, you find this with midwives and doctors in the birthing environment, where they, they try to fight, they, they, they try to fight for the power on the personal level, rather than just stepping in to the power of the universal feminine. And that's why I, I teach this class, Tracking Spirit in the Birth Environment. What I'm trying to do is to just really stand in that and help the mother stand in that so that there's no, there's no discussion about power exchanges. There's the, that it's, you're beyond it. And you can, you can do that in everyday life. You can do that in a corporate environment. You can do that in the family environment. You can do that, um, practice doing that in, in traditional places where there would be power exchanges and power over one another. And that is actually much more effective than the, the and again, I'm not criticizing the feminists of the 70s because we all owe them a great deal and we have no idea how much we owe them, especially anyone who was born after 1970. You have no idea how much you owe those women. <laughs> so, so um, but, um, uh, but, but they, were, they were caught in the power exchange place, of per, the exchange of personal power. And here, we, you know, when we're trying to cultivate the sacred feminine, we're trying to cultivate, and this is why the daily meditation is so helpful, cultivate what it is to actually hold the, that sacred feminine power. And there's no discussion. You, know, you just hold it. And whether anybody realizes it or not, whether anybody reacts to it or not, you're holding it. And you're acting from that place, which is generative, which is creative, which is sharing, which is cooperative. That was yeah. a long question. No, no, no. There's just, there's so few, I hate saying this, because uh, it's not going to come out right. There are just, there are so few cultural manifestations of it to have as touch points as a woman. I mean, as, as far as like the broad, you know. You're not going to find it within the cultural context. Yeah, no, and I just, that's why like my ego is saying that to you. Yes. And that's why I brought up the ego point as part of that navigation because um, you answered it in a way that I'm processing. I'm sorry. Okay. You have to go beyond the cultural yeah. context. Yeah. There are very few yes. examples of the divine feminine in the cultural, in the Western, the dominant Western paradigm because women have done a number on themselves by giving up their power to men for their own devices, right? And so it's not like they're the victims, they did it, right? And so it's a matter of taking back the power on a personal level and then dedicating your personal power to understanding how do I hold divine power more effectively so that I don't get caught in these kinds of power exchanges believing that someone else has power that I need, or that I have to give up my power to someone else in order to get something, right? It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that you seem to, ego, you know, you shouldn't make a mechanism out of ego. I don't know if you know that, but Freud never used that word. He wrote, used the German word I, it says ich, you know, ich, I-C-H. He referred to the I, the pronoun. <coughs> and ego is the Greek pronoun. Right. So the guy who translated him into English uh, decided that the I was sounded too non-technical and non-scientific. So he thought if I grab a Greek word, the Greek pronoun, it would sound like very high-tech te 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 people. So it would be more persuasive to them. So then there's, you know, they got into the, you know, the id ego, super ego, like as if they were different things running around in there. In the Buddhist view, there is no fixed thing running around there. The, the, the I is just a pronoun. It's actually language, which itself is the culture there, which organizes your sense of self. And so it very much has to do with your inner narrative and how you're talking about yourself. So that's just a minor self point of what you're talking about. Uh, in the, the power thing, I am more confused about it myself. <clears throat> in the sense that I think they do talk about the power. Buddha, Buddha has, you know, power, and he has uh, compassion and love, and he has wisdom. Sometimes it's three different things. And there are the three important satans, you know, Avalokiteshvara and Tara as a team. You know, he's so passive compassion. Sensitivity of she's the active miracle, compassion, and love activated. 
then you have the wisdom of mother tree, then you have the power of the mother. However, that is against the background of where the Buddha redefined in his tradition and community in India. They redefined the idea of power from uh, the idea of divine, from the idea of a, of a creative God who has like a dominating power. So I think the issue of standing in power, the language of it, which I think is valid and useful, and I don't quite know how to wield it myself. So that's why I say I'm puzzled. But is it sort of behind that language is the idea of what is the power? When you stand in power, what is power? What is it? And where does it come from? And what is it? And in, in the Buddhist discovery, Buddha's discovery, that power comes through surrender rather than conquest. Conquest occurs by someone feeling powerless and therefore somehow thinking by doing something to someone else they're going to get power that they don't feel they have. Whereas real power is a sense that reality itself sustains you infinitely and immortally. And therefore, you don't need to conquer anybody else. You somehow have absorbed everything else in a certain way already. And it's not even different from you. And that gives you the much greater power. Because in a way, it's like, you know, the guy referred to mantra Shri, And mantra Shri uh, has a very fierce form related to the empty teaching, which is called Yama Antak. Yama is the Indian god of death, and he has a buffalo head, not like a western bison, but an Indian buffalo, with short hair and spreading horns like that. A mahe, as they call it in India. I don't know if you've been to India. It's a kind of buffalo. It has black, yes. black it has things like that. And uh, so Yamanta, the form of Yamantaka is a being with a infinite number of buffalo heads, something like that, and many arms and legs, like sort of reflecting back to Yama, infinite Yama. So in a way, he scares death to death. <laughs> but then death can't die because there is no death anymore. So then death becomes a protector of life. It's, a mar it's like immortality through love as the death of death. It's really sort of cool. It's really the transmogrification of power, actually. Uh, but Manjushri can only do that because Manjushri is not holding on to a rigid core that is opposing the rigid core of the Lord of Death. The rigid Lord of Death has rigid, he kills it. He kills people. But, but, uh, but Manjushri just absorbs the Lord of Death. And the Lord of Death discovers that he himself is life. If you're something like that. I hope that, I don't know if that's yeah. popular express either. So, so I'm, you know, although I, I know Isa expresses that in a beautiful and important way, and I know it's very important actually in relation to women, because for sure women are disempowered in the world today, and it's what it is the heart of the world's problems. For example, population control and stuff. There is one known solution to that, which is to educate and empower women. And then they tell that guy, go watch school, go watch TV. What the hell are you? You know, it's a horrible joke. It's a too vulgar joke. Then I won't write it. No, I'm not that. <laughs> oh, okay, I won't tell it. <laughs> 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 <Good one. laughs> I really can't tell it. It's short. It's silence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell it. So, so the point is, it's a very important thing, but, but, the, but the key thing, I think, another way you could put where the where Gloria Steinem company went a little, you know, got a little dissatisfied, was that they just felt disempowered, and on that basis wanted to gain control of the power that was from people, who, men, who were actually disempowered themselves, and therefore violently hoping to get power by dominating people, which itself is weakness. And instead of discovering through spiritual paths that through a kind of profound surrender, but yet, you know, like the dark night of the soul of John of the Cross, you know, it's only when you completely despair and give it up, and then suddenly you find yourself welled up by the loving energy of the 
of the Lord in their case. Well, that loving energy is not somebody creating the world and walking around sending it to hell. It's a very different vision of what God is. Actually, it's more like a Buddhist vision of the clear line of the void, you know. So, so the the female is more capable of maintaining herself in a condition of surrender at a level of a deeper basic sense of connection to the cosmos. And that basis of power is, as you say, it's, then you're, I believe you're your expression, then you're just there, you know. You might be sitting. Or you could be even lying down on one elbow. <laughs> you know, it is not necessarily standing, but you could also stand. But because you are so sort of connected to the one who's, who's, who's confronting you, and you are you're like behind them at the same time as in front of them. Whereas they are just isolated by themselves, and you're just the other object. And so it's so it's a it's a more subtle thing, I think. I think. I'm I'm confused about it, but I think that's the case. What's that? I said power is a complicated word, so it's... Well, that's why I was trying to differentiate between personal power and universal power, right? Power over us and power with, right? Um, but, um, yeah. So anyway, power can sometimes mean an ability. Right. And sometimes it can seem to mean a force. Right. So when it's an ability, it's not necessarily a force, it's a, but potential. It's a potential. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't... Did Nina have a question? I may not have something to say. I'm not, I'm not quiet, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> what? We what do you want to say? So you had a question earlier. No, I didn't have any question. Okay. All right. Power is a part of some people's character. Some people you meet and you say, my wife was a powerful woman. And it's inherent. It's not something they, they just, you could feel it. That if when they make a decision, when they're going to do something, they, they are. And so power is something... And in a way, you inherit. You have it. It's there. You don't go get it someplace. I don't yeah. know. Ideally. Well, if, you know, if you deeply know that, you know. One, one of the issues is that people, but, but, but one of the issues that I was talking to is that many relationships are based on power exchanges where people are trading universal, they're trading personal power, they're trading some aspect of their power to someone else hoping they're going to get something for it. So what happens when that happens is that there's a lot of power loss yeah. and people don't actually have any power. And one of the big problems, and you see this with indigenous people who have had their power taken from them in every possible way by colonizers, they will try to, they, will, they, they, they lose the capacity to go into, and, and this is no criticism, this is completely understandable, they, they lost the connection because it's been deliberately destroyed by the colonizers. They've lost their connection with the roots of their own, the, uh, of the power of their own spiritual traditions. So they're left in this battle where they have to try to fight on the personal power level, trying to get back some kind of measure of equity. And that generally leads to further disempowerment and you know further degeneration in terms of their ability to understand their situation, understand what their identities actually are because they become totally identified with this struggle. And again, the way that ideally, and you saw this like in the ghost dances in the late 1800s among the Plains Indians where they were trying to go back to the roots of their spiritual traditions in order to confront this terrible struggle on a personal power level between the whites and the indigenous people around the time of the Trail of Tears, of the, 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 the relocations of all the different tribes into these, you know, areas of arid, you know, lifeless land. And so, um, you know, and the, you know, that effort to go back with the ghost dance to the source of their original spiritual power was an effort to get beyond those power exchanges. And, you know, it's really too bad the whites had guns, you know, because, and smallpox, because I think the Indians would have had a, a, fair, a fair chance by, by returning to their spiritual sources because the white people clearly 
itself did not have any kind of connection with these deeper levels of compassion and power that um, that are exemplified in many of the um, teachers and guides in in the in the shamanic traditions. Of course, you know they talk about this compassionate power in terms of God, the Holy Ghost, the Son of God, but but they were not acting from that compassionate place in um, interacting with the indigenous people. So, so there's no, you know, I'm just getting a little bit lost here, but I'm just trying to really just, you know, show you that there are situations where there are not, people do not have in, 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 in themselves a sense of power that they have developed or that they can stand in because they have had experiences on a cultural level where that kind of holding of power is not permitted, or that if they try to hold that kind of power, they are confronted and they wind up again in these power struggles of power exchanges on a personal level where everyone loses. And you know, that is the more um, quote unquote male way of interacting. And of course, when we're talking about the sacred feminine, you know, again, I go back again and again, and it doesn't have to be an expression of a female. That, that does this, but definitely when you're looking at the spirit of the earth, when you're looking at Gaia, there's definitely this generative, creative, cooperative kind of spirit that is, you know, when you can learn how to stand in it, you stand in that universal power without fear of any kind of separation or exile or, you know, any, you know, any kind of fear of any loss that you might have any of the relationships that you have formed in those power exchanges. You know, you can have a different way of being. And um, by doing you know, something like the daily meditation, by connecting with the great, great mother on the land here, by doing some of the meditations that we're doing, hopefully you're going to get a better and better idea of what it is to to stand in power, because that is a universal power, because that is something that you can do, you can develop that. That is absolutely developable. Yeah. Yeah, no. well, I'm going to say, um, when it comes to, you know, like, personal power, you know, what does that mean, personal power? And um, then I think that, you know, when you deal with confusion, the more confused you are about it, to the nature of reality or why you're here at all, or what's the meaning of life? All of these sort of fundamental questions, if you're all confused about it, you will feel very powerless. And the more clarity that you can gain in insight into these um, perennial questions, the more power you will naturally occur, because you, when you get rid of the confusion and clarity occurs, the natural power arises. That's one thing. And then the other thing is that personal power is something that you can gain when you're facing obstacles and very difficult crises and situations in your life. You know, very, very difficult, painful situations that you have to struggle with. And if you are able to, over, you know, to go through a difficult experience and come out of it, okay, then you will naturally be much, much stronger and have gained a tremendous more personal power, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I'm just talking about, I'm not talking about universal power, I'm talking about personal power that each one of us can have. And I'm saying that it has a lot to do with um, when you're working through confusion. And, and coming to understand, like, you know, why are you here and what is your purpose? If you can connect with, everyone has a purpose. If you can connect with the purpose in your life, um, then you're connected. That's the sort of the universal thing that you're connecting with then, okay? And then a lot of clarity comes with that. And, and there, there's a, like a path, there's a road, you know, you know what to do. You know how to be, you know what's right, you know what's wrong. And that gives a lot of personal power. And then the other thing, as I said, is that when you uh, have lived through a difficult um, internal crisis, be it emotional or whatever, 
or it can be physical, it can be many different things, but we, everybody has in life to confront these difficulties. And if you can <coughs> overcome them, you know, however difficult it may be, you will come out at the other end and you come out with a lot more personal power as you grow. So those are my two things that I would like to share. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think that along the same lines, I guess, that the power has a lot to do with choice, with the concept of choice and uh -huh. the ability to make choices. Yeah, sure. Which I think is partly what ties together a lot of the, the um, we can talk about the, the Native Americans, we can talk about um, many. Um, disenfranchised groups today, what the women's movement in part was about, about giving people that sense of choice, that we yeah. had a choice, and that in the same way when you go through something that's hard, um, you have a choice of how you respond in yes. it. And in, Absolutely. Buddhism, and in Buddhism, mm -hmm. um, at least for me, um, Part of the learning for me was about the choices yeah. that I could make and how I responded and how yeah. I respond to someone who's um, not as kind as they might otherwise be to me or who makes my life uh, not as smooth as it might otherwise be or, or yeah. gives me an obstacle. And, and over time, yeah. many years, um, <coughs> You know, a long time. I'm 67. It took me a long time to get to this. I can actually see that when someone is um, presents me with a painful opportunity, that I actually have a choice. <laughs> yeah. You want to it? But I have a choice to say, yeah. do Do I want to be angry? Do I want to be um, hurt? Do I want to dissolve? Or do I want to really um, thank them? For that opportunity to learn something, that's awesome. um, or move something, yes. At, or and at the same time, um, in my ego part, see it as presenting them with an opportunity. Yes. To yeah. um, <laughs> you know, when people say uh, really hurtful things to you, um, and not often do people, but sometimes they do to me. You know, it took a while to see, oh, you know, what a struggle they must have, and that this is the way that they chose, they thought this would make them feel better. Yeah, they, is this? They, if someone says something to you that's really oh, yeah, yeah. for instance, you can take it as about you, or you have a choice, or you yeah. can say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that, that you have to be going through this, you know, and this is how it manifests. I, I like to say that it takes me not like five minutes to get to that. It takes me sometimes yeah. like five days or <laughs> maybe, um, maybe, maybe, maybe longer, but, but, I, but it's fact, the reason I'm just saying this is that to me is power. You know, that's, but I recognize that not everyone has power. Um, and that sometimes we expect people, we say to people, you have the power to be different, but we're asking them to do that in the midst of a whole lot of places where they don't have choices. I have choices in almost every area of right. my life. Right. And, um, and so that gives me that sort of freedom. But that's how I think about, you know, really what power is and what it is that we're trying. When we say we want to empower someone, I want to give you the choice. You're making me think of, I just finished writing a review of a wonderful book by a wonderful woman who lives in Beijing, whose mother is Tibetan and father is Chinese. Her name is Selin Osem, and she has received awards and so on, which she's been not allowed to accept by the Chinese government. She's often put house arrest, her blogs are shut down, things like that. But she managed to get a book out there called Tibet on Fire, in which she is kind of studying, in a way, way is celebrating, worrying about, and paying profound homage to the 152 Tibetans who have burned their bodies 
in a situation where the Chinese have done everything conceivable to provide them, to prove, to deprive them of any possible choice in what to do, what they think, what they say, what they do. And so, and people are very, in Buddhist world, are very freaked out about them. Why are these people, they're not Buddhist people committing suicide, they're very fine. And even some Tibetans uh, are acting like it's some really weird thing. But it's so brilliant, you know, to, what you said, made me think so strongly about because in the only way they can voice their choice and say, okay, you people have like tried to lock us up and put us in your materialist communist machine and say we have no right to choose to be Tibetan. We in a way we have no right to choose to live as we wish to live. So now we will die as we choose to live. And we really and but we won't hurt you in the process. Will give you an opportunity to wake up to the stupidity of trying to domineer us in the way you have done for 60 years. And we are going on to a more glorious future. And it's very interesting that Western people call that self-immolation. But the Tibetan language does not say self. It says immolating one's body, or immolating or offering one's body. It doesn't say immolating oneself, because you can't burn yourself. Because yourself, it continues. You just, do, but you are giving away a very precious body. And some of them were very young, many women, as well as men, many, many nuns, as well as monks. And, and the Swedish, she was cheerful people. We've been, she, she tracks down some of the past and what they said, and you know, a few of them. The Chinese make it really difficult to get to them and find out, try to pretend they're all neurotic or they're all like, they're terrorists and something. It was actually, it strikes terror in the hearts of the dominator. But someone has that degree of personal freedom that they can put their, they can make an offer of their own body. Okay, here, you want to dominate my body? I'm sorry, you're not, you have no right to dominate my body. And you can't kill me because I'm going to give my own life before that. <laughs> ah! It's very grim, kind of, but it's incredibly powerful. I, I, I remember only recently, I used to say, I used to give a, give a calculus of world peace. And, you know, because the world is complete. One reason we can't solve any of these problems is we're totally militarized. And then the militarization internally of nations of their police forces is just the same as the militarization of their military forces. Same thing. And so, I used to say, we will never have world peace until more people are willing to die not to hurt another person, as now are willing to die in the process of hurting other people. And I never even realized that these 152 Tibetans so far, and there are probably others who are not in this present wave, they are the beginning of that wave, anti-militaristic, non-violent wave, where the non-violent person shows the same willingness of the military hero conditioned to run into the machine gun to get their buddies over and win the battle, do you know what I mean? Which is also giving their life, mm -hmm. giving their body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, they, but that's to hurt other people. And these people are doing that not to hurt, and they're showing their freedom of choice. Thank you. What is your name again? Nancy, I'm one of the names. Nancy. 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 Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be so grim, but you mentioned Native Americans, and that's yeah, all about India. Yeah. And uh, it's a genocide. It is one, aren't it? And it's a marvel. I'm so, I'm so like, moved by that. Another question? Yes, dear. Actually, we, we should, you said you wanted to make short and take a short and things, and not before 9 o'clock. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Y
feed through the nostrils and it's their congestion. Tuck your chin a little. Try to straighten the spine. Fold the hands in the lap or link the fingers. In a chair, cross your ankles. Seated, of course, sit cross legged. And then, So our special menlock thing is to feel the presence of the healing Buddhas, the deep dark blue Buddha, or the healing Taras, or the great mother, as sort of infused in the earth, water, fire, wind, all the elements within you and around you. And don't feel your usual isolated self with various self-descriptions, self-narratives that you're not a good meditator. And just let yourself float and be buoyed with the infinite positivity imagined around you. then within you. And then turn your awareness into yourself as if you were looking back into your own face and into your own brain and into your own skeleton and body and flesh and blood and organs and nerves and whatever sense of your own psychophysical complex you have and you're looking there for what is indelibly and really you that which you feel you refer to when you go I or ego as the Greeks will go or ich as the Germans will or je as the French will do yo as the Spanish will And what quickly will come to you is you don't really know where that I lands. You don't find something shaped like a bar with flanged ed ends standing straight up like the letter I, where the I fits on. You don't find a piece of flesh. You don't find a position in you amongst the millions and billions of neurons. You don't find a bone in the middle of your spine. You don't, certainly it's not the beating heart muscle. And this might make you, should, if you look smart and if you're a little anxious. And if you do it with a sharp intelligence, it might make you feel a little dizzy. But now you welcome that dizziness. You don't feel bad about it. You don't feel anxious about it. You say that what this is, is I'm beginning to feel myself, my sense of fixed self melting. And you let yourself melt. And as you let yourself melt, and then, but then, and then <coughs> you get a little worry, some feeling, oh, maybe, oh, maybe I'm the one, oh, maybe I'll lose track of who I am. Then keep embracing that and then try to reflect on the fact that the infinite energy of the Great Mother, the Earth Goddess or Pragna Paramita, or whoever we're calling her, holds you in her emptiness womb, infinite emptiness and compassion womb, in total security and nurturance nurture and peaceful. She's not prodding you to do anything. She is not dominating you. She is the bed of infinite energy you rest in when you feel you melt away from your sense of self-control, self-maintenance. Of self erection. 
your self standing, self positioning. As you lose, as you melt that down by not finding any real core there, you are more aware of your being embraced from the beginninglessness by this clear light of wisdom, motherhood. And therefore this leads to the sleep yoga of Menla, which you do when you sleep. And when you fall asleep, as you let go of your different sense organs, content, close your eyes, close your ears, turn off the lights, relax into the pillow, let everything go. Don't indulge in the idea that you just become unconscious and, and, and lie in nothingness. Feel the clear light of avoidance, the clear light of emptiness, the clear light of the void. The bliss of the mother is where you really lie, when you let go of your own muscles and cells and fibers and nerves and organs. The mother embraces everyone and infuses them with new energy and renews them. And they draw infinite renewal from her supercharging infinite presence. So then when you wake up, you rise from the clear light of reality and totally recharge. Okay, take this. Let's go. Let's see.